All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Berean Community Church Sunday School. Wish we could be all together in person, but I hope you'll take advantage of the chat or of texting so that we can at least have some connection with each other now. We're going to keep going in our study of biblical discernment in just a moment. But first, I thought we uh, we uh, really need to devote ourselves to the Lord in prayer and ask for His wisdom. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for your spirit within us. He is our teacher and our guide. We know that on account of divine uh, wisdom and revelation, we have uh, also been instructed to the means of grace of having human teachers, of having men and women who interact with us at different levels, who, uh, who, who encourage us to godliness. And we know that among those who would influence us toward Christ are also those who uh, would challenge or somehow derail our allegiance to Christ. And we seek discernment to please you in the truth, in the most uh, gracious exercise of our faith. Would you please help us so that we do exactly as what would please you and uh, that, that we, uh, we do it in a way that honors your word and that uh, is guided by your spirit. Lord, thank you uh, for each saint uh, in our church and gathered around the computer screen today. Would you please use us uh, to encourage and equip each other in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, good morning again to you. Really, really glad to have this interaction together. And uh, again, let me just remind you, if you want to chat or text, uh, then I will try and interact with you as best I can. There were some great questions that came out of last week's class. And as a result, uh, I've, I've uh, added some specific content this week. And uh, I also am probably going to go into a third session on this topic because we've had such good questions, such good interaction, and uh, I hope it's actually specifically profitable for you in some of the different questions and uh, situations you might face. So we will get underway here and see what progress we can make. We are indeed talking about discernment, uh, and I've, I've thought about the... Uh, the, the specific topics, but also some devotions that I would present uh, that would just just give a little bit of a framework for how to use the idea of discernment. Uh, so today, let me uh, let, let me just give this opening thought here. This was embedded in my first session, but uh, the, the technical difficulties might have washed it out. Let me let me caution you that discernment is never a godly way to just conceal an attack towards someone. Now look, uh, the Apostle Paul was very forthright sometimes in proclaiming that certain men were heretics, to watch them, to stay away from them, to not listen to them. But the idea of using discernment as just some kind of backhanded attack on a person's character or family or a claim to faith when the issue isn't biblically justified is uh, not the way that God wants us to treat one another. Discernment is not a weapon to get what we want, so we don't use uh, questions of motives, questions of doctrine, uh, to play politics with somebody else. We do it for the glory of God. Uh, being discerning is never an excuse for exalting yourself over others. I'm a, I'm a better teacher because if you're more discerning than, than uh, such and such over here, you'll realize their doctrinal flaws. Well, that, that just invites the kind of pride that Christ hates. And discernment doesn't mean that we have the same perfect insight into men's hearts that God has. So we can certainly discern doctrines. Uh, we can discern actions. We can discern uh, truths about denominations or churches. Uh, and we are even called to be wise men who draw out the hearts of other men. But to, to draw out does not necessarily equate to a perfect omniscience, where we can always say that we know what's in the heart of man. And in fact, wasn't that one of the claims of Christ to Godhood, was that he knew what was in the hearts of men? We're not the same as him. So we need to make sure that uh, we do not use discernment 
for a goal that the Lord would not bless. But let's remember to focus on what he does want, which is that discernment is a way to submit to God in personal holiness and truth. So we make sure that our life, our influences are pure and that what we're doing is honoring to the Lord. Um, and it seeks everything starting from our purity of belief uh, by protecting the back door of right living. And I, I just want to point out to you how the, the idea of going astray in practice will tempt a man to corrupt himself doctrinally, just as much as going astray doctrinally will tempt him to corrupt his practice. Think about 1 Timothy 1.19. Keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and sh suffered shipwreck in regards to their faith. You abandon a good conscience. You sear your conscience. And all of a sudden, uh, you do not have a, uh, a, a good walk of faith. You can attack good doctrine from the back door, from the uh, purity of life. So we, we, uh, we protect both what we believe and how we live. And uh, discernment seeks peace among believers. So that means that when there's a conflict, we look into the source of it, we look into the truth of it, and we encourage believers uh, to all seek the Lord together. So these are the, the things that we should be using discernment for. All right. Well, we, um, we were talking... Uh, about a particular case study last time of how to evaluate the question of women in a teaching ministry, in writing or in speaking, and uh, to stack it up biblically. And we talked about the different doctrines that, that might uh, take effect here. Bibliology, wh what is the scripture, what is God's revelation, theology proper, doctrine of God, Christology, doctrine of Christ, pneumatology, doctrine of the Spirit, Anthropology, doctrine of man, homardiology, doctrine of sin, soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, angelology, so dealing with both good and bad angels, angels and demons, if you will, ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, and eschatology, doctrine of things to come, or doctrine of last things. And we went through some of the people uh, giving their input to this current cultural crisis, this current Christian crisis. Um, issue Beth Moore saying that if we took all of the New Testament and especially if we centered on Christ we would realize that there's hypocrisy in preventing women from teaching um, or preaching pardon me uh, but in, in counter to that Owen Strand says that there's no way for a woman to wield the word of God without it being authoritative so she should be kept from the pulpit. John Dixon says that uh, teaching that is Forbidden is only uh, this specific act of laying down the traditions handed on by the apostles. Thus, it is not anything that we would do today because we have the traditions of the apostles here in Scripture. So we, uh, we would not need to, to uh, be concerned about that. They are already laid down. So a woman should be allowed to give sermons. Tim Challies says that a woman should be allowed to write theology books, uh, Christian living, uh, commentaries that, that uh, men and women are both encouraged to read. Dan Phillips says that gets awkward really fast. Are you sure about that? So we've gone through some of our basic steps. We're continually submitting to new teaching from Scripture, uh, trying to discover who's talking about the issue, what theological issues are in play, and we talked about some anthropology, ecclesiology, and bibliology, especially in this issue, uh, God's revelation, the church, and pneumatology is tied in there with spiritual gifts, and then the nature of mankind, man and woman. And then step number four, we turn to getting some clarity from scripture, and that's really where we're at now. So we want to um, dig into a bit more of what scripture says. Now, as we do that, we talked last time a little bit about anthropology, that there is an inherent nature of a helper within a woman, uh, that there are general ramifications for this, but then that there are very specific ones in a submission in, uh, in a marriage relationship and then in the church. So we started there, and then today what I really want to draw your attention to is the issue of bibliology. 
How does this issue of women teaching affect what we believe about Scripture? Uh, that's a big issue, uh, bigger than you might have realized. If you look at what Beth Moore says, her contention is that above all else, we must search the attitudes and practices of Christ Jesus himself toward women. Now, she might have a point here in, in a couple matters. Uh, there is no more supreme example for us than the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, because the Lord Jesus Christ is the pinnacle, if you look at Philippians 2, of humility, of deference toward one another, of love, and we're exhorted to follow him. So if that is her point, she is absolutely right. We need to follow the Lord Jesus. Um, if she means that we are to follow the instructions of, of the Lord Jesus, uh, then she is absolutely right in that. He commanded us to love one another. New commandment I give to you. But I suspect that there is more because what she said was that above all else, we must search the practices of Christ Jesus. She did not merely refer to his attitude, but to his practice. So if we're going to look into what Jesus Christ did in practice, that's a different claim. That's saying that we must align our practice uh, based on what Jesus Christ did. And I, I, would, I would say that that is, in fact, elevating one part of Scripture against another. So let, let, me, um, let me just reiterate this with my, my slides here. So if, um, if we imitate what, what, uh, what, what Christ did in his attitude, it's absolutely correct. If we follow his instruction, that's great. But if we elevate one part of Scripture against another, I want you to see that. If, if we were to say that uh, we, sh we should follow all of Scripture, but especially what Jesus says, we get into kind of this le red letter attitude about the Scripture. And that misses a couple important points. One that I don't have any slide for, but that is worth pointing out is uh, there are no non-red letter portions of Scripture. All of Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Christ is the Word of the Father. God does not talk out of two sides of his mouth. So there is... There is no pinning one point of Scripture against another as if they compete. Now, this really takes us to one of the key issues in this matter, and I think Craig Blumberg sums it up well. I uh, really do commend to you a, a, a good book uh, called Evangelical Hermeneutics. And if you want to get into some of the technical matters here, this would really help you understand hermeneutics, which is the uh, principles by which scripture is interpreted. And uh, Craig Bloomberg says, I think that if we as evangelicals take seriously our doctrine of the plenary inspiration of scripture, that is, all of scripture, the fullness of scripture is inspired, you won't find one word anywhere that's not inspired, then it is hermeneutically impossible to set up one text as the interpretative grid interpretive grid through which everything else must be filtered. So if you say that this one verse is a way to interpret all of the Bible and the plain meaning of the Bible doesn't matter unless you give this verse the chance to modify and refine it, then we're actually pitting the Bible against itself and that dishonors the Lord. We can't go there. So in light of that, um, we need to look at the idea of progressive revelation because we certainly understand that there are changes in the Bible. There are things that happen differently uh, throughout different eras in Scripture. But that is not the same as God talking out of two sides of his mouth. So let me just contend first that from Christ, revelation moves forward. Christ in and of himself did not intend for the gospel accounts to be the last word of instruction for the church. Now, he didn't mean for any bit of the gospels to be discarded, but neither did he mean that they were the last word. 
earth. So to this point, let's go here. John 16, Jesus says, But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, so that is finally in his ascension, the helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. The Spirit is working in partnership with the Father and the Son to proclaim additional truth, additional guidance that is to their advantage to have. So here we see that Jesus himself teaches that there is more revelation to come that they're not able to handle now. They're in the middle of the, the grief uh, and the culmination of Christ's sacrifice, but eventually it would come. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets, in many portions and in many ways in these last days, has spoken to us in his Son whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. You see even there that there is a past, a present, and a future to God's plan. In the past, God spoke to the prophets in many portions, in many ways. In the present, he speaks through or in his son. So his son speaking on earth and then also through the son's apostles as they are on earth recording what would become written scripture and then it says the future whom he appointed heir of all things the inheritance of christ is coming to its fruition so we see here uh that that there is a past revelation a present revelation and a future purpose for the revelation Rollin McCune, in what has become an under-discussed systematic theology released about 10 years ago, but something that has so many helpful pages, uh, he, he says, God unfolded his revelation according to a two-dimensioned tandem manner. God was considering two things, as he willed to give it and as humans were able to receive it. And God tailored his revelation according to his will and human capacity to receive it. You think of things like uh, Jesus explaining divorce restrictions, stating that the uh, full teaching on marriage was not enforced because of the hardness of the hearts of the Pharisees. So th there was a, a consideration for the willingness of the recipients. It is therefore this emphasis on progress that prevents a purely linear view of God's dealing with mankind that we're we're all just on the same plane the whole way through. That's not the right view just yet. So now uh, he says that progressive revelation emphasizes the movement of history toward a goal, which scripture describes as the fullness of time. So there is a goal that God is driving to. And that means we, uh, we are closer to the goal than anyone else, and we're actually continuing to get closer. So we've got quite a, uh, a perspective here. If we start to see revelation in light of the unfolding purposes of God. So let's keep going as we talk about scripture. Uh, many have pointed to the uh, example of Old Testament judges um, and how Deborah was, for instance, one of the um, judges and how she uh, is an example of a prophetess, someone who would, would speak truth in the New Testament context. Well, the New Testament will have to wait until next week. We've got enough content for this morning, uh, but I, I want to talk just a little bit uh, about the Deborah issue. Because when we're talking about bibliology, we talk about the progress of Revelation. Uh, but we also need to talk about some of the specific anecdotes, some of the specific stumbling blocks along the way in Revelation. Um, and so we uh, should go to the book of Judges if you have your copy of God's Word. 
invite you to turn there. And let's talk a little bit about the nature of Deborah's ministry. Here's kind of the general argument. Well, uh, if, if we are supposed to consider that men have a teaching office or a preaching office, depending on how you express it in the church, and if these men are supposed to, uh, to then uh, have this, the qualified men have this exclusive office, other men don't have it, women don't have it, um, then we should be able to see the consistency of that with Scripture. But wait, if we go to the Old Testament, we see some female um, prophetesses or uh, women of other uh, prominence that have a spiritual influence. So what do we do with them? Well, um, let, let's start with the book of Judges and see does, does um, Deborah's place poke some kind of hole in the idea that men have a particular leading role. Well, Deborah is recorded in Judges 4 and 5. And so if you if you consider uh, some of these different factors that I've shown listed on your screen, you'll see some differences. I'd invite you to turn in your Bibles so that we can look at all these together. Let's start by looking at how some of the judges are introduced. How are the judges introduced? Well, in chapter 3, we've got the first judge, Othniel, and uh, he has a very simple explanation. It says, when the sons of, I'm sorry, Judges 3 verse 9 says, when the sons of Israel cried to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the sons of Israel to deliver them. So before we even get to human action, uh, Othniel is raised up by God's action. Uh, so Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel. So we've got a specific initiation of his ministry from God. We've got the spirit dwelling upon him. And then uh, we've got the second judge, Ehud. Uh, this is, th this is the, the judge that should probably have his own action series here. The left-handed judge who stabs the, the sword into the fat belly of Eglon to kill the oppressor king of Israel. Uh, but it says at the beginning of his account, verse 15, When the sons of Israel cried to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them, Ehud the son of Gera. Now the formula does vary a little bit. So uh, I'm not saying that uh, the exact words are used all throughout Judges, but there is a general idea that God is raising up those who would judge Israel. And uh, so then, as we go to consider Deborah, we're, we're going to take a look at, at a little bit of a different explanation. So chapter 4, Then the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor, and the commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harasheth Hagoyim. The sons of Israel cried to the Lord, for he had 900 iron chariots, and he oppressed the sons of Israel severely for 20 years. So there's the prayer. But then it says, Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife, wife of Lapidot, was judging Israel at that time. Now what it does not say is that God appointed her as judge, that God raised her up. I want to make two points about this, because uh, I think there is a certain balance here. One, uh, there is something significant to having a pattern and breaking a pattern. So first judge, God raised up. Second judge, God raised up. And then this, um, you, you, you may or may not call Shamgar of any significance. I think he's probably listed there, at least in part, just to explain how he is used in a song of praise later. He's in the last verse of chapter 3. But then you get to the third major character, Deborah, and she's not introduced as a judge. We broke the pattern. So we're clearly supposed to see something here. There is a difference. Now, I don't want to make too much of a difference. That's the second thing I want to say, which is that I think Deborah was put there, just like any of us in any of our circumstances, by divine providence. God did raise her up for her particular moment. God did use her for the ministry that she had. 
But I think the, the reason that we see something of a break between uh, the pattern of the first two male judges and Deborah is that God is trying to set something off as a difference. So let's see a little bit more of what the difference is. So Deborah happened to be judging Israel, and by every account, this is a, a faithful thing. Uh, she used to sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the sons of Israel came up to her for judgment. So she is, um, she is there giving uh, judgment, and this seems perhaps because people are coming to her to be more than just the idea of a military judge. Most of the, of the judges uh, are referenced as military judges, as commanding generals, if you will. But Deborah really seems to be resolving conflict or disputes or giving some kind of, of legislative or judicial authority here because people are coming to her. She's not going out to wage war, but people are coming to, uh, to hear her. So she is, um, she is going on and uh, she is, is judging them. Now, it gets to the specific matter of delivering Israel. And, um, well, I, I should make one other, one other point. So, so Deborah is, is at least in this part responsive to those who come to her. And then advisory. She is giving advice to male leaders. So consider verses 6 and 7. Now she sent and summoned Barak the son of Abinoam from Kedesh Naphtali, and said to him, Behold, the Lord, the God of Israel, has commanded, Go and march to Mount Tabor, and take with you ten thousand men from the sons of Naphtali and from the sons of Zebulun. So here is this instruction that God wants to pass along that, that uh, he is to go. So this points to the advisory role, because what Deborah is doing is she is, uh, she is pointing out to him what he should be doing. He should be going and, uh, and leading the military. He should be fulfilling his role as a man to, uh, to, to accomplish God's will. But then, as, uh, as it happens, he did not want to do that. And so circumstances change. But uh, Deborah, just to make the point, was responsive and advisory. How, how does that uh, contrast with the nature of the other male judges well, they were actually personally leading the charge. So in Judges 3.10, just to use Othniel as an example, um, he went out to war or to go to Ehud. Uh, he grabbed a sword and he presented his tribute to Eglon and he uh, executed the plot that he had to bring down the king. So there was a great difference in the way that they went to do the Lord's business. Now, I don't want to portray either of these as any more or less the Lord's business. Both were the Lord's business. I don't want to portray either one as more or less valuable. Both were valuable. But they're different. So we need to talk about the difference. Who was the audience to whom Deborah spoke? Well, she spoke privately with those parties that she was judging and publicly with Barak. Or I'm sorry, privately with Barak. Compare that to the public audience of the judges going before kings, calling men to war. I put um, Judges 7-1 in there when uh, what happened was Gideon went out and called the men of, of Israel to himself. And then he started sorting them. But he had thousands and thousands of men that he was interacting with. In the sense of a military involvement, uh, you, you've got these men who are leading the charge, going out to battle. But then if you look at how Deborah structured her involvement, and I think this is by a design of God, Judges 4, 6, she tells um, Barak, you go and march out. And, um, and, and then uh, then uh, Deborah says that she will play an assisting role. I will draw out to you Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots. 
So she was going to be part of some kind of a feint or a, uh, a, a, a maneuver that would bring out the armies of, uh, of the enemy of Sisera into a trap. And then when, when they were out there, it was Barak's job to execute the military action against them and to, uh, to see them finished off. And then further on, uh, you, you see that Deborah was very strongly desirous to give Barak the claim of victory, to give him the opportunity to lead this. Because in verse 8, when he shrinks back, if you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. The Lord going with him wasn't enough. He needed Deborah to go. And this was a sign of cowardice, of, of not trusting in the Lord's promises. So Deborah says, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the honor shall not be yours on the journey that you are about to take. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hands of a woman. So the, the implication there is that the honor should have been Barak's. He should have been leading this charge. So then we, uh, we go to the glory and we kind of got to, to this issue a little bit with the, the honor going to a woman. But let's talk about this a little bit more. There is a recognition of the faithfulness of the men who follow the Lord as, as faithful judges. And if you were to look through these other passages in uh, Judges, you will see that there are times where the men are claimed for actually having the victory. But sadly, if you look through Judges, the involvement of women 95% of the time shows the shame of the men. Remember, Judges is about every man doing what was right in his own eyes. Now, I'm sorry I don't remember the author, but I remember reading one author who said, if your support for your theological position or for your particular practice is that somebody in Judges did it, beware. Because what you're doing is quoting a book of people who are right in their own eyes, but not in God's. So if we're going to say Judges gives us permission to, uh, to, to do this thing, eh, we might want to reconsider a stronger scriptural support from elsewhere. So consider the rest of, uh, of this chart, because as you look on here, women throughout the, the book of Judges, I'm not saying women are always the unfaithful ones, because sometimes they're doing exactly what God would have them do, but they show by their righteousness the unrighteousness of men. So uh, you, you see here that Deborah is one of our first examples. And then uh, further on, she sings the praises of the woman Jael who killed Sisera uh, when Sisera fled to her tent. So two women were exalted in this story of the cowardice of men. Then if, if you were to go on, you would see that Abimelech uh, was a wicked king of Israel in chapter 9. And so as he is laying siege, there's a tower in this particular city that he's trying to attack. And all the men and women, and it specifically says the leaders, go into that tower. Well, of anyone in that tower, who should be the one to want to defeat this wicked man and to preserve the lives of everyone there? The leaders of the city and the men of the city. But who does it? The woman who drops the millstone down on Abimelech's head. So there's a tragic failure on a part of the men. Now, uh, then when we, when we go further on, we've got the tragedy of Jephthah, whose daughter and her simple faith is set against her father's foolish, foolish vow. You've got the, um, uh, the uh, incident with Samson and Delilah. Delilah tricking and, and out-beguiling Samson. And uh, though she is not necessarily a virtuous woman, she is showing the uh, moral bankruptcy of Samson at that time. Then if, uh, if you were to go on to Judges chapter 19, the concubine of the priest was greatly abused and the men did not value her life. Uh, and then last, 
uh, you see the uh, sleight of hand that happened to give the men of Dan wives by allowing them to steal them from other tribes of Israel. And so all throughout what we're seeing in the book of Judges is a tragedy with regard to the treatment of women and with regard to the leadership of men. So should we go to the book of Judges as our proof? No, I think God gave an accurate, supernatural word to Deborah in order that she would shame the cowardly leadership of Barak in her day. And I think she did her job exactly right. She honored the Lord in what she did, but she is not a standing example of how we should conduct ourselves as far as permitting men or women to engage in, uh, in public teaching roles. She is not our proof. Now, let me just say that uh, the example of submissive Deborah, who desired to help and uphold the, the male leaders around her, is also shown when you turn from the issue of judges to the issue of prophets in general. So let, let's just consider that uh, there, there were other prophetesses in the Bible. And, and consider, for instance, Huldah in 2 Kings 22. In 2 Kings 22, Huldah uh, was given the opportunity to speak to the king as he sent for a word uh, from a prophet. And so here, uh, we've, got, we've got Hilkiah, the priest who goes to Huldah and asks on behalf of the king. And uh, when, when they ask her, she is willing to give them a private word from the Lord. Tell the man who sent you to me, thus says the Lord. Uh, and, and then she gives doom. And uh, you see, even in her example, she's giving a private counsel. It is one of shame to the nation. So the idea of, uh, of hearing it from a woman uh, parallels with Isaiah 3 and 4 about women and children leading them. And in fact, the rarity of hearing from a woman should be a clue to us in ourselves that this is not God's normal pattern for leadership, but this is a unique expression of judgment given in private that the king will need to deal with for his, his leadership of the kingdom. So those are just a couple examples in the Old Testament uh, about uh, appeals to female leaders and how they might be used to support a case for present teaching. Now, Next week, we need to turn to the New Testament, and we, we really need to wrap up our study with some conclusions, with some real action items as far as what we are to do uh, to honor the gifts of the Spirit, to honor the members of the body of Christ, and to honor the way that the Lord intends for the house of God to be run. So, uh, I think we'll need to stop here to give time for a few questions if you have them. And then we'll consider uh, New Testament and kind of wrapping up some of our method next week. Uh, so I, uh, I appreciate you all with your welcoming words on the chat. But now if you have any questions that you want to type, please, please do uh, mention them so that we can interact a little bit. And I appreciate those of you who gave questions last week because uh, I, I tried to include them as best I could in the flow of a lesson this week. So anybody want to type a, a question, please do feel free. I'll tell you what, I'm going to give just another minute to allow for somebody to, to give a question. Now let me just tell you where we're going next week uh, so that you, uh, you kind of know what to expect. So we have talked through some of the first four steps, and we'll go through a little bit about the church and the Holy Spirit next week. And after we do that, then we need to go to our last couple steps. So 
uh, we will take a look at our scriptural findings. What, what do we have that is absolute instruction? Thus says the Lord, do not depart from this. You must run the church this way. You must honor authority this way. You must handle men and women's gifts and calling this way. What are general principles? Um, honor male headship. Honor the gifts of the Spirit given to both men and women. What are the general principles by which we need to abide that, that will temper our actions in each situation? And as you've started to see, for instance, with some of the Old Testament prophetesses, uh, what are some of the non-binding descriptions? Things that may, uh, that most certainly do have a spiritual value, but uh, are not instructive for today on this matter. We're going to then try and sort those issues into importance. So wh where do I need to separate? Where do I need to say a person who believes this and that about women teaching and preaching is not a Christian? Not sure that we have too many of those issues. Where do I need to say this isn't the kind of church or conference or book that uh, the Lord wants me to be interacting with? And where do we say, you know what, these are just differences between brothers. And so uh, we, will, we will work together and realize when the topic comes up, we'll need a few minutes to remind each other of our disagreements and have a brotherly conversation. But this is, this is not the biggest deal. And then we will start with a, an application. And really the last thing, which is one of the goals of the class, is how would you explain this to someone else? How would you persuade them? How would you show them, you know, this is God's will. This is really best. And I hope that you delight to live up to this. So we'll, we'll get into some of those last steps next time. All right, good. So uh, we, uh, we have... A question here. When we look at the Old Testament findings, um, to to try and take an accurate look, for instance, at Deborah, um, how do these influence our practice now? Women exposing men's unfaithful leadership. Well, um, so just in the in the very nature of of church life, there will be times where your pastors and elders don't make the right choice. So we, uh, we do hear from people who say, you know, I, I get what you're going for, but consider it this way. And we hear from women as well as men who help to temper us. And uh, the Lord is always honored with a private uh, appeal. You know, it is the glory of a man to conceal a fault. Go and confront your brother privately. So if there seems to be something that is not going well, uh, it, th th there's a godly thing about coming and saying, we support the ministry of this church. We are behind it. We want things to go well. Uh, and to that end, can we consider how to be more faithful to the Lord in this area? And, and that kind of an appeal is a very winsome thing and a very necessary thing. Now, we do firmly subscribe to the idea that the elders are to lead the church. But... What we don't subscribe to is that the elders are the only ones who have any spiritual wisdom in the church or any biblical insight. So uh, it, it is right for members to bring up different questions and concerns uh, because those do shape how the church operates. And I mean, just quite frankly, speaking of the six years I've been here, have shaped uh, the, the ebb and flow of different decisions that we've made. Uh, so... If there is, Alicia, to speak to the first comment you made, if there is something that is specifically unfaithful, um, because of the power of Scripture and the, the gift of the Holy Spirit on each man and, and woman, uh, then it would be appropriate for a woman who's convinced that there is, is something important to talk about to, to go and speak privately, just as Deborah and Barak spoke and spoke concerning the authority of God. Um, and, and then you consider the way that Aquila and Priscilla shared with Apollos uh, the truths about the full ministry of Christ because he didn't know about the resurrection of Christ and the coming of the Spirit. He only, he only knew limited information. So they shared with him. And this is a great example because where there was a man who could get involved, the man came and and, and sought to engage in teaching. But here this sister in Christ, who sees the truth of God more accurately, uh, also exercised this um, 
this endowment of the spirit that she was responding to the word of God to give it to another. So uh, those would be uh, maybe a couple scriptural principles for how we would see that laid out. And that's why, you know, hallway conversations and community group conversations, whether they're between men and men or women and women or mixed groups are so valuable because we learn something from each other. Uh, So thank you for that, Alicia. Thank you, Brett, for your kind words. Uh, So I'll tell you what, we're going to sign off here and I'm going to switch to uh, downstairs in the sanctuary while we get ready to have our digital meeting, so to speak, and uh, worshiping the Lord as best we can. Boy, do we miss you. Uh, It'll be great to be all together. Thank you all for bearing with me in an online format. And I do invite you to email other questions or text me uh, so that I can consider different specific issues that might, uh, might come to your minds while we're going through these. All right, next week, we will try to stop extending this particular issue, wrap up the issue, of women teaching and preaching, and then go on to other issues uh, that are of need in the church. All right, God bless. Have a great Lord's Day.